Hey friends, I want to welcome you to another photo book club. Uh, this time, I am going to dive deep into the publications of Annie Leibovitz. She is probably the only living photographer that most people are able to name uh, by name when I had my in-person beginning photography classes in the Phoenix Metro. Uh, certainly people can name Ansel Adams, but he's dead. And a few people would name somebody big on Instagram like Humans of New York. But you know, Annie Leibovitz is by far the name that I heard most consistently. She's worked for Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, uh, many other huge publications. And she's one of the few photographers I have work hanging in my house. Uh, I have the portrait she did of John Lennon and Yoko Ono on the day that John Lennon was assassinated. It's a photograph I love uh, without all the extra connotations of it. I just think that it's it's so simple. It says so much about their relationship, how much John needed her and how naked he could be, uh, how, how absolutely free he could be around Yoko. Um, and of course, like historically, it's so important. And uh, I've taken Annie's master class. I have looked at her work a lot over the years. I've been to her exhibition of women in New York. Um, that happens to be one of the books that I wasn't able to pick up for what we're about to do now, but I got a lot of other Annie Leibovitz books and uh, there are ones I haven't looked at in a while. So when we dive into those, you're gonna get my honest reaction to the photos. Um, whatever your opinions are though, I would love to hear them in the comments below. You know, Annie Leibovitz, uh, she's not only a good photographer, she's sometimes a polarizing figure too. A lot of people who have met her in person, have worked on her shoots, don't necessarily always have the nicest things to say about her. And um, I don't know what to tell you beyond, because I've never met her, and I feel like she's presented herself as an artist, artist at all times. And I know being an artist, artist sometimes rubs people the wrong way, especially when uh, we are I count myself among that crowd. Uh, sometimes we come across as very la-di-da, like we don't care about the details, like we're asking for things that might be impossible. Um, but if you're getting to a place of pure creativity, I feel like that's what you gotta do. You gotta just like riff and you gotta come up with stuff that is impossible. And sometimes you ask people for things that aren't as like, fact specific as detail oriented and it rubs those kind of people the wrong way. So that said, let's dive right in. So here we have a selection of Annie Leibovitz books that I got from my local Chandler library. They don't have all of her books. A significant one that's missing is her collection of portraits of women. We have Annie Leibovitz at work. This is something that has um, chapters that sort of tell the story behind the photographs and also divide up between all the different genres she's worked in. I see dance, war, uh, politics, advertising, so on and so forth. We have Pilgrimage, which involves trips she took and photographs she took of places that weren't assignments. And um, there's little stories that go with all these objects. We'll get into that. We have Olympic Portraits, which was the only one I've ever actually bought. I bought this at a remainder at a Borders years and years ago. Photographs 1970 to 1990. This is a collection that includes a lot of those iconic uh, Rolling Stone images, the Bruce Springsteen stuff, the John Lennon stuff. This is the photo I actually have framed in my house. I'm already blown away with just opening this for, you know, five seconds. Oh my goodness. And then we have A Photographer's Life, 1990 to 2005. Uh, this book I've checked out in the past. If I'm recalling it correctly, it's divided into her kind of corporate work, stuff that she did for Vanity Fair, and then stuff that was um, personal to her. It definitely flips back and forth. We're going to get into all of these. We're going to start with your greatest hits though, 1970 to 1990. This book is, in my mind, an essential uh, kind of thing 
not that we need to own every photo book, but I think every photographer who's interested in creative portraiture really should look at this because it goes to show how many ideas one person can generate even in a 15 year span. How many of these ideas are set up ideas? How many of these ideas are just taking advantage of opportunities that appear before them? These are Annie's uh, family members. This gives you kind of like a very casual, this is what they're up to, uh, reportage type of image. And this one is a little more of a person in their environment and they know they're getting their picture taken. Um, I really love this natural portrait and I love the richness of the entire environment. It's not clean. It has so many different colors and textures uh, that are portrayed black and white, but you can tell that everything looks different. Um, this full frame technique on the 35 mil neg is something I used to do a lot when I was a college student and I got yelled at by my professors for using full frame but I still think it's really cool and definitely something that's lost in the uh, modern digital era. When you present something full frame, it 100% screams, this is a photograph, but it also shows confidence that the photographer has that everything I took with my camera is how I intended it to be. I'm not a purist in the sense that I think you have to um, always present the entire frame of a picture, but I, I recognize the game of a master when they get it right in the camera and they don't need to do any sort of judicious cropping uh, after the fact and they aren't, you know, realizing that they could have walked closer to this dude. Uh, they got it as it should be. One of the most natural pictures I've ever seen of John Lennon. I mean, this one of George Jones sitting around in what looks like his underwear in a fancy hotel room with a picture on the wall, um, possibly of himself. And the plastic on the lampshade, disco ball looking thing over here, that's cool as hell. Some of these I question why they got the big double page spread treatment versus that George Jones photo, that Tammy Wynette photo. I'm gonna skip through some of this early Rolling Stone stuff. Richard Pryor, I have never seen this photograph before today. This is amazing. He has like a stocking over his head and he has just a super pensive look. Uh, I'm not sure if the color is translating perfectly to you guys, but this is like almost orangey on his skin and everything around it is kind of greenish yellow. Andy Warhol with artificial turf. Kind of a Napoleon stance with his hand, some junk shoved in his pockets, um, kind of a crummy background. I love working and playing with artificiality in my portraits. I've never seen this one before today, but it feels like something that I want to rip off really badly. Uh, like today, yesterday, I want to rip this off. A master photographer like Annie, they have assignments where they go out and do reportage and then they have the kind of shoots where they get a chance to set up some stuff and in my experience it doesn't really matter how much you set up in advance you could be on the scene and encounter something like this or this and if you're just open to what's visual around you then you can capture some incredible stuff Another very artificial photograph. This is Sally Rand, 1978. Big fan of that. Lots of cool textures going on between the feathers and this tarp looking stuff that they didn't even unroll all the way on the bottom. In fact, I think that might be upside down. That might be the roll that normally would be up here because I see a clothespin at the top of this tarp. Muhammad Ali, incredible red popping off of this. Lauren Hutton in mud, not completely nude. You can see that she has like bikini bottom on down here and then uh, this thing mimicking pubic hair is just a bunch of grass. Not an easy thing to get a person to lay in mud for you for a photograph, that's for sure. An image like this, Peter Brook, 
This looks like a completely different photographer. This looks like uh, the guy that I grew up uh, inspired by to become a photographer, Sebastio Salgado. This does not even look remotely like anything Annie Leibovitz does. This one's Sammy Davis Jr. I'm not like super familiar with Sammy Davis Jr., but the flatness of his face as it goes straight into the hat, and I think his eyes are closed here. This is so incredible. This blue pops so much. There are pictures that are definitely like intended to be the iconic image. This one of Kirby Puckett is prime example of that. That is the iconic image. Even this black and white one here, you know, those are anthemic iconic images. This one of Christopher Walken, this is a moment. This is not meant to represent him at all stages of his life. It's just this tiny little sliver of time. The kind of images that I personally gravitate towards um, because you know what? There's like a story to those. When you have an iconic image, it feels like the climax of the story. The story's already been told. That is like the, um, you know, if you were to watch Avengers Infinity War and somebody asked you what happened and you said uh, Thanos kills half the universe. This is not a spoiler for a movie that's been out for a few years. Um, he kills half the universe, you know. That pretty much sums up like the most important thing you need to know about a movie and that's what an iconic moment does. But the little bits in between are what fascinate me. There are more I can build with this kind of information. And I like that this one is a sequence too. I don't think I saw any other sequences in this book. An amazing book. Annie Leibovitz, 1970 to 1990. I'm just gonna briefly touch on at work because so much of this is text. And in a lot of ways, it's a summary of how photographers work. You see a lot of the same images that we saw in the other book. For beginning photographers, this is the book to hit first because you're getting a uh, photographer's view on a variety of genres when most of us really only work in one or two genres. I didn't know a lot of people who uh, have a chance to shoot a war, to shoot fashion, to shoot for magazines, to shoot dancers, so on and so forth. Uh, I will say that I'm still amazed. Every time I flip the page, it's a different presentation. Here's a whole chapter on Arnold Schwarzenegger. Some of these photos, when you see them really small, it takes away so much of the power. Not Annie's fault, it's just the way of the book's format. Um, I do not understand, for example, why this book, which I saw this big in the 1970s to 1990 book, uh, why it is so tiny. Is this actual size is of the 4x5 negative? I'm not sure, but it could fill up all this white space there. One of my favorites, Keith Haring body painted in his own style. Um, this is an example of a body paint shoot that I've always wanted to do, and I've worked with a few body painters in my time. I've never gotten anyone to do anything quite so elaborate or so cool as getting the environment changed as much as they change the figure in there. The Olympic Portraits book, as I said, this is one I've owned, and uh, I don't recall a single image out of it. It's not because these people aren't like super famous to me. Uh, and in fact, I would kill to photograph stuff that involves a lot of like physicality and sports type stuff, working out stuff, people being tough, making themselves into better people. But it's just that most of the images here don't pop to me and I'm not quite sure what it is that's lacking. I'm just not getting this like sense of uh, composition. In fact, maybe it's because the subjects aren't as expressive as the actors or family members um, that she's working with. Uh, that is a difficulty if you're somebody who goes for emotion and expression and you have subjects that just aren't willing to provide. But a lot of these pictures are, they're also like uh, not technically fantastic. Uh, this guy, his hair and the background, it all just kind of blends together. There's no like unique lighting. It almost looks like the crappy lighting you get in a gymnasium. Uh, he seems to have a scar that goes across his chest, but there's no emphasis to that. The whole photo is kind of out of focus. Same with the photo on the corresponding page. 
And as far as book design goes, uh, this guy looking away and not towards this direction, I don't, I mean, the people who design these books have more experience than I do, but I just feel like that's kind of poor design. These two images should be flipped. A cool concept and then a lot of sort of unused negative space around it. It also doesn't help that it's split between two pages and you have this poor binding just shatter the image straight down the middle. It honestly does not feel like her work at all. It feels like the work of somebody uh, totally different. A much more candid photographer. And I like candid photography for sure, but I also like it to be pushed even more chaotic. Um, you know, Polaroids in this style would be better suited than what appears to be 35 mil or medium format material. We've got Pilgrimage. I know I sounded unnecessarily harsh on that Olympic portrait book. Uh, pilgrimage, photographs of landscapes and objects. This has the least amount of appeal to me at all. It is very difficult in my mind to uh, tell stories of people without people in them, without direct emotions. And a photograph like this, that's given a double page spread treatment, I don't see the appeal of it at all. Um, it's possible that this is some incredibly important location, has great relevance. Uh, I'm not gonna read the text to figure that out because I feel like photographs really need to stand on their own without being, you know, overloaded with text or information. That I feel all artwork should be that way. Uh, even films, you should be able to understand what's happening or what's relevant with what's being presented to you without having somebody hold your hand and say, here's why it's important. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not particularly feeling anything out of this book, unfortunately. And this kind of imagery, although I like the culture, it does feel like a photograph anybody could take with their phone in a museum and uh, really doesn't play to the strengths of Annie Leibovitz. All right, I wanted to finish strong. Uh, I know I was a little harsh on those last two books, just weren't my thing. The Olympics portrait book felt like um, I'm looking at a totally different kind of photographer who doesn't have a lot of control over their environment, is working with expressionless models, probably under a lot of pressure too. I know that uh, there were some famous Olympic portraits done a couple years ago where the photographers basically had like a cubicle to work with to shoot the athletes and these were like good photographers in kind of the most um, stressful unappealing situations trying to make good work we got another greatest hits package here photographer's life 1990 to 2005 i know this book has a lot of her personal work in it as well as her celebrity stuff and i really celebrate that because i think during this um time period annie ended up uh raising a family with Susan Sontag and September 11th happened and a lot of other things that were just like really epic moments and it's these intimate ones though man all that paper the typewriter the the curled up pose that's so cool the glasses turned to the side you got stuff like this baby in the air the wind blowing it's almost like Supergirl uh, that is that is like the joy of life kind of material. This guy with his leg in the air. All of this family stuff is timeless. And I love seeing 35 millimeter in all its grain and uh, full frame, just blown up super huge across two pages. Iconic Demi Moore, <clears throat> iconic Demi Moore portraits. For people who aren't familiar with Annie Leibovitz's work, I think they'd be stunned at how many pictures uh, she took and they actually know. This one is one of my all-time favorites. I'm a sucker for body paint work and you know it's not easy to find good body paint photographs, um, but they went the extra mile 
by having the paint bleed into the hair and then the hair swoop up like so. This person really looks like what an alien should look like instead of on Star Trek where they just have a bunch of stuff stuck to their forehead. Nelson Mandela. And seeing stuff like this, and I'm gonna have to censor it for YouTube, but I gotta say I'm happy that to know that uh, all photographers photograph their loved ones in these kind of scenarios, not just me being a pervert with my wife. Nah, it doesn't count as being a pervert, it's your wife! Photographers wanna take pictures of everything. I think the good ones, like Annie, have a drive to encapsulate the whole of human experience. So even something that's like very simple, family portrait stuff, things that are just gonna be framed in a home that aren't gonna be published in a magazine, you know? When you have the passion for that kind of material, as much as you do shooting somebody who's super famous or doing a job that you get paid a lot of money for, um, I think that's the heart of a true artist. They're gonna do it no matter what the circumstances are. Jack Nicholson at his rumpled best. Uh, this scene is just silly. I love it. And it's got that added element of wind. You can never underestimate what having water or wind or fire in your picture, um, how it makes it come to life. You know, if this was shot indoor in the studio, you could accomplish that with a fan, but like I get the sense that this is Sunday morning for Jack. Got those silly socks. Some kind of animal on the bottom of his socks. Some kind of animal down there on his toes. Brad Pitt and some crazy colors, crazy cowboy boots. Textures and colors everywhere, man. This thing is amazing. The OJ trial. Now this is a, one of those kind of photos that ends up in the book because it has somebody famous. It's like a famous moment in history. Um, never a fan of those kind of things. It's not O.J. Simpson photographed by Annie Leibovitz. It's that time that Annie Leibovitz was in the same room as O.J. Simpson and took a photo while he was walking by. And I have pictures like that. I have pictures of uh, Bono <laughs> through a car window, and I have Hillary Clinton walking by in a parade, but you know, I wouldn't put that in my portfolio because it was just the time that Hillary Clinton walked by me. Now, there's pictures that showcase people without showing their face, but it's, it's like a thing that we forget that we can do as photographers, that we don't have to have a person's face in it. Uh, we don't have to clean up all the skin. I don't know if you can see the veins in this person. We don't have to have proper colors. Scarlett Johansson. This is like a mix of uh, glamour and some goodwill stuff. Can't take a bad photograph of her. So friends, I hope you had some fun looking at some Annie Leibovitz books. Wish I had the entire series of her work to look at right here because uh, she has absolutely achieved this plateau of journalism, commercial work, fine art, uh, personal work that I want to achieve. Now, I'm not a very commercial person, um, but to be able to say that you were such a master at an art form that you're able to be used or you're able to function in any of those scenarios is, it's very, very rare. She's just a huge influence. Uh, I don't love all of her work, as I said, as we looked at the books, but you know, I can't think of a single band that I love every single thing they make all of my favorite bands have an album or songs that I'm like, I don't know about this, doesn't speak directly to me. I, it's kind of absurd, actually, to expect that everything that another human being makes speaks directly to you. I don't even like all the things I make. So, you know, um, but once again, thanks for sticking around. Let me know what you thought of Leibowitz's work. Has Annie had any influence on you? You don't like Annie. Tell me what you think about that. All that in the comments below. See you next book club.